Commons family, it's Carrie, and I just wanted to welcome you to this week's service. Um, in this unique time, we're just really thankful that we can still gather, even if it is kind of virtually in a different way, but still experiencing that rhythm of our weekly service with you guys has been really fun. Um, if you're able to watch this during our premiere, then you can actually comment underneath our video and it'll show up live. So it might even feel like you're kind of chatting with friends in the lobby before church, maybe not quite, but still we'd like to hear from you guys. And if you want to mention where you're watching from or how things are going for, for you um, during quarantine, we just love to hear from you guys. So that would be awesome. Um, during this time before we transition to worship and um, a service, a message from Charlie, um, I wanted to just read something from St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, not so much to be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we awake to eternal life. Can't hear me 
lay your troubles down in your dark moments when your heart's weak bring yourself broken you will find me the road the rain the road the sun process of adopting a second baby um and sadie has agreed to do a fundraiser for us obviously we want more right <laughs> um sadie has agreed to do a fundraiser for us it was so fun to do portraits on easter and we really loved getting them but we knew a lot of people didn't get the chance to so we're going to go ahead and do the same front porch project on mother's day may 10th um, and if you would like to sign up, it's donation based, so you can donate as much as you want. Um, and it would just help us bring our baby home. Um, the process of fundraising has been long because it costs about $40,000 to adopt a domestic infant privately. And so any support would be awesome. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can email Sadie at flagstaffcommons.com. Thanks guys. Thanks Tessa and Ryan. Now we're going live to Charlie for a special interview. Hello Commons family, I'm up at the office and I'm really excited uh, for this announcement to get to introduce you to two of my friends. This is Roxana and Rocio and uh, they're here to talk about today what we're going to be doing this week to fill the truck. So Roxana and Rocio, could you first just tell us uh, who you're with organization wise? My name is Roxana Cardiel. I am the organizer for Northern Arizona Interfaith Council, and I also go to San Francisco de Asís Catholic Parish. Hi, my name is Rocío, and I am a member of San Francisco de Asís Church. Well, thank you both for being here. We love praying for your church. We love praying for all the churches in town. We celebrate how much we share in common in the faith and our mission. And during this time of coronavirus, I'm excited for our community to get to hear from you a little bit about what it's like in Flagstaff 
to be an undocumented person. Um, I know, Rocio, you're very connected to that community. And so I would like to ask, what has that been like uh, for the families that you know here in our town that are undocumented? Yeah. Now, in this, this time, these moments, the community, immigrant community is a really hard time, mm -hmm. very sad and worried time for them. Um, is it like all of America, or their loss of jobs the main source of this? Most of the people I know, they, they stop their jobs in hotels and restaurants, so they are you know, working right now. Yeah, so here in our town, a lot of the flag staff and restaurant workers obviously can't be working. And one of the things that hit me really hard that I want to ask you just to help us understand is obviously they can't get federal help in the form of a stimulus check. Yeah, exactly. They don't qualify for the, any any help. And no support or help. No so support. no unemployment from the state um, no, no. or health insurance. No insurance, no yeah. help, government help. Well, that being the case, what are the biggest needs right now in the immigrant community? Uh, now the biggest uh, they need, the, the things they need right now is they are worried to pay rent. Mm. They were to buy food, mm -hmm. and some people in the community they, they people is sick, so they need to buy medicine and without insurance, with no insurance, yeah. with no job, no, no job, jobs. no insurance, no government support. Okay, well, I want to just again say thank you for sharing some of that with us. This might feel really short today. Uh, I wish we could interview for an hour, and maybe we will in the future. Because what I'm excited to talk about is. The Commons and Northern Arizona Interfaith Council and the Catholic Church, we're trying to partner together to do more than just fill the truck. That's what we're announcing right now. But we're working on a program of connecting relationally our communities so we can learn from and grow uh, together. And this week it's about fill the truck. So we'll put a list of items up on the screen that you can bring. So Wednesday, come to this office between noon and one and help us provide the resources for our sisters and brothers in the community right now that have a unique challenge with no support and help that we can be a part of filling the void and being the big C church together, which is <laughs> to me family and what it's all about. So please join us this Wednesday and then pay attention as we start to develop an even more exciting kind of program uh, to connect us to this part of our community who we love so dearly. So thanks so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Well, fill the truck. That's cool, we get to help other families. Want another way to help our friends? Check out the GoFundMe. The good for me. Check out this GoFundMe. It helps our undocumented friends. Another way you can give is through our website. Here it is. Select Fill the Truck. That supports these families. Or you can give to the General Fund. The General Fund. The General Fund. Jenny Bob General Fund. However you say it. Or give to the General Fund. That really helps the Commons right now. Thanks for listening, everyone. Have an awesome day. Peace out, dudes. Hello, Commons family. Welcome back to my office for another online service at the Commons. Uh, we, before we go into the sermon portion of our service, we love to pray for other churches in town. We always have when we met in real life, and we've been doing that online still. And today I want to pray for San Francisco de Assis Parish, the Catholic Church here in Flagstaff. You, uh, I think, just got to meet Roxana and Rocio, friends of mine, and I thought we would pray for them and Father Will over there. So if you're the praying type, join me and, and we'll lift up our, our Catholic sisters and brothers. Lord, thank you for uh, the gift of the universal church, the Catholic Church. Lord, thank you that the big C church is what we're all a part of uh, by your love and by your grace. And we're thankful 
for the long and beautiful service of the Catholic Church in the world and in this town. And uh, we're thinking of and praying for uh, Father Will right now and uh, all the priests here locally, Father Matt, and uh, just pray for all that gather at the Catholic Church. Thank you for their reach and their diversity and their uh, message of love and peace. And I just, uh, we pray that they experienced you at Mass this morning. Lord, we also ask today uh, as we open up passages of the scripture, would you please open our hearts and minds for what you might have for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it seems like the uh, it seems about the seventy billionth week of us doing online service, and uh, and since I've become a televangelist, which is a very strange transition, it's very hard for me uh, week by week to stare at that camera lens right there instead of human eyeballs. In fact, uh, you might notice uh, as I go along, I'll probably be staring all around the room because I sometimes just can't stare at that lens. But I am thankful. I'm really thankful for the medium um, during these strange times and beautiful times. Today was a beautiful, gorgeous day. Got out on some walks and uh, played hacky sack with my kids and smelled the fresh spring air. Spring has definitely sprung and uh, that's going to be somewhat of what we're talking about today. But I thought uh, to transition to kind of our a uh, new series that we're going through. I would share with you a video and a story that happened to me this week. I was up at the office uh, working, and when I went home, Marco was still working, and I went home, and the kids had been home uh, by themselves. And when I got there, there was a note on the door telling me that I needed to go to the backyard because the kids were putting on a show. And so I did that, and when I went back there, I, Sierra was filming me as I stood on the deck, and this happened. So uh, you might have noticed a couple things in that video. Uh, you might have noticed that I wasn't wearing glasses or uh, I didn't have a watch on. Um, and I was standing there pretty dumb, uh, dumbly <laughs> as I was about to get water dumped on my head. You might ask why that is, but I want to show you the note that the kids put on the door here. It's really adorable. You might notice, hopefully it's floating in this region here. Uh, that cutely the word uh, they were putting on a show says they were pooting on a show which I thought was really hilarious they were pooting on a show but at the bottom it said no watches or phones allowed for safety reasons and so uh, as you might imagine as a parent I was able to deduce what was about to happen to me especially in the part when they said I should stand in a green circle when I go out to watch their show uh, so sometimes that's what moms and dads do right we know what's coming and we just have to we have to take it because that's what that's what love is right but how did I know right? Am I Sherlock? Am I some sort of uh, incredible detective? Well, no. The, the reason I knew is because the reason any of you knew if you read that note is we naturally as humans have this ability to deduce things or induce things. We have a, a way of using reasons and, uh, and looking at evidence to forecast the future. And uh, there's actually a fancy term for that, uh, at least especially used in the 20th century. It's called the scientific method. And the reason I bring that up is because today I'm going to be talking about the scientific method a little bit at church, which may seem a little bizarre to you, unless you already know that we're in a new series called Reconstruction. And the purpose of this series, the whole idea that I have for a conversation we can all collectively have as a community, is there's a lot of people in our community who have deconstructed their faith, uh, have experienced something of an unsettling or a discomfort or a decentering of the things that they believed. And it, for some people, it shakes them to the core, to the existential core, maybe a loss of faith. Um, and I think there's a way to reconstruct faith after that. Uh, and so that's kind of what this whole conversation is about. And so week by week, I'm going to take one particular section or idea that people have deconstructed and try to look at a way that we maybe can reconstruct and have a new, more vibrant or flourishing faith. And today's topic is science. Uh, now, why is that? Why would science be something that would have to be deconstructed? I'm sure most of you uh, immediately have answers to that if you uh, grew up in America or anywhere around evangelicalism, because they're almost seems to be an unspoken agreement in society and in our culture 
that science and faith are in conflict with each other. And there's very good reasons for believing that. In this country particularly, in the last 150 years uh, especially, it, they, those two things have been in conflict. American evangelicalism has been in conflict with science in courts, in the Scopes monkey trials with evolution, all sorts of different things. Young Earth creation, there's all sorts of things in which uh, climate change evangelicals in America often find themselves standing against the findings of the consensus of scientific theory. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Here's my hope. My hope is actually to help deconstruct some faith that I think can be harmful or a barrier to other people experiencing God and God's love, and then reconstruct something hopefully a lot more vibrant. Now, for some of you, I, I, I love that there's a diverse group of people that watch our online services and come and worship with us together. Some of you may not have gone through this deconstruction process, and some of this may be a little bit challenging to you. Some of you are on the other extreme and may not have any time for any of this because you spent a, a large portion of your life thinking and talking and researching about this. But here's the basic problem. The basic problem is in American Christianity, there's a huge assumption that the Bible is the source of scientific truth. Uh, and that comes from a lot of different places, but in the late 1800s, specifically at Princeton Theological Seminary, which is now a more progressive seminary, but in the late 1880s, 1890s, there was a few theological professors who started to use words from actually Roman Catholicism that they used about the Pope, about the Bible, that the Bible was inerrant or without errors. And what began to happen was uh, another birthing forth of Christian fundamentalism. All, all religions have a branch of fundamentalists, people who believe their text is literally true, the source of all inerrant truth. Many Christians, uh, without maybe spending a lot of time thinking about the history of where that came from or, or what they mean when they say that, assume that this in some way encapsulates even scientific knowledge, that everything we need to know about the earth is contained in the Bible. So. One thing that I hope we can understand as I have this discussion about science, how it relates to the Bible, is that they're inseparable in the theological language of Christianity. Because your view of the Bible, or what sort of thing the Bible is, or maybe more specifically, what sort of truth the Bible contains, will very much affect the way we conflict or embrace or dance with modern science. Here's some of the things I love about science. Science isn't a, a consistent set of doctrines. In fact, one of the things that many religious people critique about science is they say, hey, a hundred years ago scientists thought this and now we know this. Science changes all the time, so it's a lesser form of information, whereas the Bible has stayed the same forever and, and that's the real sort of truth. Um, I don't think that's a completely crazy uh, thought. It's true, science does change, but that's actually the strength of the scientific method. When you think of the philosophers like Francis Bacon and Rene Descartes, Descartes the people who kind of shaped our modern way of thinking or gaining knowledge, um, what they were talking about was ideas like rationalism versus empiricism or empirical evidence. And that's where we got this very idea of a process of deducing or inducing uh, information based on evidence-based practices. By looking at our experiences, that's empirical evidence, things that we can experience, we can measure, and they're repeatable. We came up with this method of hypothesis and guessing and skepticism and testing and reproducible uh, results so that we can come up with theories and then we can move forward in our knowledge. And it's been, obviously, I don't have to make the case for how powerful the movement of empirical science has been. If you have a smartwatch or a smartphone or a car, or you're watching this online through this camera that I'm videoing science, mathematics, it's behind all of this. Now, those are not in any way at odds with the Christian faith. In fact, most of the thinkers in the Western world were Christian thinkers along the way. Kepler and Galileo and Isaac Newton, even Charles Darwin. Uh, Einstein, was he was Jewish, but a theist in, uh, in a, his own way. So faith and science empirically do not conflict with each other. In fact, today, uh, if you poll the, the general population, scientists are a little bit lower in, in specific questions if they have faith in God. About 40% of scientists uh, would say that they pray to a personal God in a relationship, which is a very specific religious encounter. And so I think it's important to note that they are definitely not in conflict with each other. So where 
is the tension. Well, in my own life, the tension came early and often. I was, a, as I mocked last week, a Christian t-shirt wearing kid, but I also went to creation evolution conferences. So I went and studied and heard from uh, scientists who, who did not agree with the general consensus about the age of the earth. And I was eager to believe that. And I also wanted to believe that the Bible contained truth that was better than what modern scientists had. And it was actually strange, the links that I would go to, the hydrospheric theory and the firmament of Earth raining down as Noah's floods and uh, to explain dinosaurs away. Because the reality is, um, young Earth creationists uh, are facing overwhelming exp uh, empirical evidence. We have an incredible fossil record. Uh, we have incredible isotope dating of uh, not only carbon-14, which only dates things in 40 to 50,000 years, but we also have potassium-254 and an incredible radioactive decay rates where we can see trapped inside of little crystals protected from volcanoes how long certain things have been around. We can uh, radiocarbon date uh, asteroids that have come from space to date our solar system. Even here in Flagstaff, just drive for 45 minutes and you get to Meteor Crater, which is one of the most important uh, evidences we have of the age of the Earth. That 50,000-year-old Meteor Crater contained a meteor, which helped us understand the age of our solar system. You can go to Lowell Observatory and see a piece of it. It's, it's right here where we can see it and touch it. And, uh, and I know and I have friends here in town who think that the earth is young. And they think that because they think they have to think that because the Bible says that. First of all, the Bible doesn't say that. Um, the only dating of the age of the earth came from an Irish monk several hundred years ago who tried to use genealogies literally to put an age of 4,000 years before Christ and a 6,000 year old earth. And even Augustine in the 3rd and 4th centuries mocked the idea of Christians who would not understand that the earth is really old. He could understand in the 4th century, just looking at geology around him, that this is an old, beautiful gift, uh, this blue pearl that we're floating around on. So I think what I would say is that it, it's it, part of my own journey was having to go way down the rabbit hole because I wanted to believe uh, that the Bible was literally true in every way. Here is the problem that I want to help deconstruct a little bit before we reconstruct. Um, I didn't go far enough down the rabbit hole on the Bible side back then, because what you would find, especially in the Jewish scriptures, is that the the Old Testament, as we would use in, in our American Christian language, is filled with dragons and unicorns and giants in the film, the sons of God get with the sons of man, and men who speak and create earthquakes and fire serpents and sea monsters. And the reality is, um, it's difficult to try to force a book like that into being a science textbook when that was never the intent. That's not the sort of book the Bible is. It's really, really so much better than that. In fact, the analogy that I, I would like to use, that doesn't mean it's not true. It just means it has a different kind of truth in it. It would be like trying to take Jesus' parable of the of the woman who's looking over her whole house for a coin and, and saying, well, that coin didn't really exist, or, or the parable of the prodigal son and say, well, actually, you couldn't eat pig slop in this region. That, that's not what the parable is about. It's not about a real thing. The, the parable of the prodigal son is a type of truth that gets at us. It's an art that gets into our spiritual life, transforms the way our minds work and think, the way we interact with each other. It's a truth that's transformative. And what's difficult is we inherited this modern mindset, tried to apply it to the Bible, which was written in the ancient Near Eastern world by spiritual people who were dealing with all sorts of dragons and myths and legends. And, and God, the divine, was inspiring through them to speak to their language and their time a different kind of truth. And if we try to force it into something it's not, all we're going to experience is an inner tension and turmoil. We need to deconstruct the idea of a literal translation of a book that was meant to be so much better than that, so much deeper than that. So how do we reconstruct if that's the case? How can we view science today? How can we view the Bible today? Because what I think we might be tempted to do is overcorrect. Often I think this whole idea of deconstruction, I mentioned this last week, is more like destruction where people just go, oh, okay, unicorns, dragons, I'm out. That has no value for me. I'm done with the Bible. I'll just go do what I want to do. I'm going, whoa, 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 wait. Some of the greatest stories ever written and the greatest truth about human interactions have had dragons and unicorns and giants. And that's not even the majority of what the Bible is. It's a story of a people 
And what we can see is exodus, freedom, liberation from slavery. And we can see what it's like to be exiled or away from home and long to return to our source. And we can see what prophets are like when they call out power structures and see a kind of better truth. And there's a reason it's resonated for millennia is because these stories are gripping. Uh, the, the tragedy of Job, the existentialism of Ecclesiastes, the, the fiery politics of the, the, and the nutty prophets, uh, the beauty of the artful psalms written by a shepherd's Arab singer-songwriter all these years ago. And that's actually where I wanted to go to in Scripture as uh, we start to reconstruct something along this idea of what does it look like to have a Christian faith that embraces and celebrates science a little bit. I shared this several months ago, and I wanted to go to it again. Speaking of that singer-songwriter, Arab shepherd boy who became a king, Psalm 19, written by David, says this in verse 1, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Um, 3,000 years ago, that young artist was able to look in the sky and say, not literally, because the skies don't literally pour forth speech, they're not speaking out loud, but so much better than that, they are speaking to us. Which among us have not laid and looked at the Milky Way in the beautiful dark skies of Flagstaff or wherever you're from and felt that the skies proclaim the glory of God? Whatever that mysterious phrase is, there's no speech that it's not heard because it's not based in language. There's something about nature that speaks to us, the nature of God. In fact, the early church often talked about the book of nature and the book of Revelation. Uh, the German writer Comstenat said the Buch der Natur in the 14th century, but even before that, Tertullian. In fact, I pulled up a quote on my phone because Galileo quoted the early church father Tertur Tertullian, man, I'm having trouble saying that, who said this, we conclude that God is known first through nature and then again, more particularly by doctrine, by nature in his works and by doctrine in his revealed word. So I think what Tertullian was saying is that the first revelation of God, the divine love, transcendence, imminence, all of that thing is revealed to us in this speech that the songwriter was talking about, poured forth from nature. That God revealed the incarnation, the first incarnation, if you will, was this cosmic big bang incarnation creation thing. The first time that matter was infused with the divine in hydrogen and helium and astronomical heat and astronomical time and light and galaxies and evolution and all that is, there was this speaking of what God is like. It was the first incarnation. It was the first book. It was the first revelation long before the singer songwriter penned his poems long before the Septuagint was written in Alexandria long before the gospel writers wrote about Jesus God has been speaking and revealing and then Tertullian and Galileo and others have also recognized that we also have this beautiful gift of a different kind of truth that gives us the particular the imminent the close the connection to God well so what um, what can we possibly take from this to reconstruct our Christian faith? Well, here's what I want you to think about. Could it be that because of our particularly unique American experience of aversion to science um, and our, our kind of strange, awkward relationship that we're missing out, that science itself, the scientific method, the Baconian method of empiricism, and all that we understand, including evolution, uh, evolution and the age of the earth and the age of the universe, which is overwhelming amount of evidence. In fact, that's what I spent my master's studying in, at, in Scotland, is the relationship of theology to evolution. And, and it made me grow closer to God, learning more about even human evolution, which people are very uncomfortable with. Here's what I want you to think about. Is it possible that in a new reconstructed faith, studying human evolution and anthropology can draw you into the divine. It has for me. Uh, it makes me think about my own growth and journey as a person. 
And when I think about the time scales of evolution and the beautiful diversity, the immense diverse species, I think what could happen inside of me in a real spiritual realm in terms of evolution? Do some things have to die so that something new can evolve? In my own life, do things need to die so that more diverse species can develop in my own personality and life and human flourishing? And that's on an individual level. What about when we think on a community level or a family level? What needs to die in our family? What needs to mutate and evolve so that it can be bigger and better? Uh, I think about just the, the pure slow Earth. I think about four billion years of this planet and, and the climate crisis we're thinking about. I think about 13.9 billion years of the observable universe. And that it brings humility. Uh, it lets us reflect on our smallness. It also brings perspective to time. We are creatures in our neurobiology who live in the moment and chronology and now and hurry, hurry, hurry. But it's hard to look at even an oak tree much less a rock who formed over millions of years, less a planet or, or star systems and millions and billions of years without gaining a little peace in perspective, even in our, in our spiritual life. Um, I also think of uh, neuroscience. Uh, Hobbes' axiom in, in neurobiology is that the, the neurons that fire together wire together. So that the little neural pathways in our brain, the more they fire, they, they, they wire together into kind of like pathways through a cornfield. So we get into habits. And as we learn about our brain, maybe we're learning more about how our behavior in our individual selves can move away from addictions to self-destructive things and more towards healthy patterns because we can rewire our brain. Or maybe we can look at social patterns and see the way that our society wires itself into economic theories or ways of being that oppress and hurt poor people and we can rethink the way we rewire those things and model after the scientific method what we can change in our spiritual individual life and also our collective life. The world of quantum mechanics is, is somewhat new relatively to the time scales of the last 500 years of enlightenment and modern modernity. In quantum mechanics, I, I once took a free online course at MIT to learn a little bit about the way in which electrons seemingly disappear and reappear. They don't follow any of the laws of Newtonian physics, and it's wonderful. <laughs> it's awe-inspiring. To me, that brings back the humility of science and our relationship to God and the divine, the awe and wonder, childlike of what's happening at that level, what mysteries lie ahead in quantum computing, what lies forward for us as a species. But here's the, the thing that I think religion can now offer to science. All of this time, I'm talking about what science can offer to us as Christians. I think Christians have a lot to offer to science. What would that be? Love. <laughs> Christ, the incarnation, the entire message of the kingdom of God can be layered over some of the greatest scientific challenges we have to face. As we have to face difficult ethical questions and our children will face things we can't imagine in climate change, cloning technology, biomedical ethics, if we don't have an ethic of self-sacrificial Christian Christ-like love that seasons and flavors our scientific method, then science is left void and cold and dark instead of vibrant. That's why I think the two are not at war with each other. I think they're a wonderful pair. Here's my hope for you. This may not be important to a lot of you this week, but I hope for some of you, it can inspire you, literally put the spirit in you uh, to celebrate science. Watch some of those documentaries you've been avoiding on Netflix and see where you can find God in evolution and in, in, in astronomy, in quantum physics, and in building bridges and helping relationships to people who science has been the thing that's taken them away from faith. Show them with your science-laden faith and how those two dance together in a partnership, how faith can also be a part of their life and invigorate them. Uh, I see Christ in that. And that's one of the things I think that's so beautiful about Christian theology is the incarnation that God is in the physical. And as we come to the communion table today, I'm uh, easily connected to that physicalness. So if you want to take a break and go grab a, a cracker or bread and grape juice, I've heard really wonderful stories. <laughs> Some of you guys are telling me the things you're doing for communion, and I think it's holy and beautiful. Um, but I want you to take the elements today. We believe everyone's welcome at the table of the Lord. It's a picture of the body of Christ 
and the blood of Christ, the, the both forgiveness and joy of the wine and the blood and the, the physicalness of Christ's body who took violence, our wrath, uh, so that we could experience forgiveness. I, I love the phrase that matter matters, and that's what we celebrate at this sacrament. So I'm going to pray over this, uh, L, this sacrament right now, and then we'll have a little bit more music for you. Lord, thank you for uh, this community, and I'm thankful, God, for the wonders of science, because like Kepler said so long ago when he said he did astronomy to think your thoughts after you, I feel that, God. It feels good to learn and grow and grope for knowledge. It's wired into us. Part of the image of God, of you in us, is to to learn about the world around us and how we can see you in it. And I pray, God, that we'll grow in that way, that we'll be a different kind of Christianity that embrace and enhances science uh, together. And as we come to the communion table today, God, I ask you to please forgive us collectively for our systemic sins. Forgive us individually for those things that keep us from your love and our depth with you. And Lord, join us one to the other as we take your body and we remember your sacrifice as we take your blood and we receive the forgiveness of sins that we cannot out your love, Lord. Let us be joyful today together and then let that inspire us to go bring joy to the hurting. Lord, we pray and feel their pain together at this time as well. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Just say to me, you'll be there for this time You'll take my place for a little while You'll give me a chance, you'll let me break you down Let me use you up, you'll show me how Your pretty little wings, they must be getting tired Trying to keep your feet up off the ground Let's go back to the days beneath the northern lights When we danced so free like a little child Just say to me, you'll lie awake this time You'll watch me sleep straight through the night No more dreams must I sacrifice My heart is safe, you got it with your Everybody, this is Beth Collier. What I found out during quarantine about Ken Collier is that he is even more kind, more tolerant, wiser, and just more fun to be around than he is even in normal times. And I made a really good decision 37 years ago when I married him. Have a good Sunday. Hey, Commons family, we miss you. We're so lucky to live with Holly Boobin, and I've learned that she's amazing at pub puzzles and um, cooking Greek food. Amos, what did you learn about someone in your family? Mommy or Daddy or yeah. Holly or Sammy? What have yeah. you learned? Something yeah. about Sammy? 
What? His special box. He has a special box. Yeah. Sammy, what have you learned about the people you live with? I know that Amos loves being done at dinner and he loves time after he sleeps. Well, time after he sleeps. We all need that sometimes. Spider-Man. Here's Spider-Man. Amos is Spider-Man. And I'm super good. <laughs> I also learned that I thought I was a mom of preschoolers, but I'm actually a mom of superheroes. One thing I've learned about the people that I'm quarantining with is that they give really, really good haircuts. My baby just turned two, and it's interesting that she's still using the words pool and library and store, even though she hasn't been to them for a few months, so it's neat to see her uh, memory. Something I've learned about the people that I'm quarantined with is that they're just incredibly kind and patient people who work hard to continue to invest in my life, um, and it's just something that I've been really grateful for during this quarantine process. <music> of the Lord is the kindness of the Lord with every breath we take the gift of life and grace the power of the Lord is the meekness of the Lord and all humanity with brave humility let your mercy flow through us
Well, that does it for another online common service. Thanks so much for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the music and the thoughts. Uh, Share it with a friend if you want to. Make sure you stay connected with Facebook and Instagram for all our live stuff. Uh, I just wanted to close this out with one final little thought I have here on my desk. Um, This is a fossil of an ammonite from 100 to 300 million years ago, and I don't know if you can see it in the light. Uh, But in person, it's stunning, and I love to feel this thing as a reminder of the science and faith stuff we're talking about. This was mother of pearl shell probably 300 million years ago, but over time it's fossilized into this iridescent greens and reds and blues and this rainbow, and uh, I love every bit of it. It's senseless beauty. I hope you guys experience some of that this week. I hope you experience it in the the living now, in the beauty of each other, in the nature all around us. And I hope the book of nature will proclaim and draw us all into the the glory of God. We love you guys, and uh, we'll see you next week.